call the meeting to order of the uh, February 27th, uh, 2017 planning board. And uh, the first item on our agenda is approval of the minutes from the January 27 meeting. Any, any comments? Will be approved the minutes. Okay, I have a motion to approve, second. second. And any comments? All right, all those in favor? Opposed, no one, because it's unanimous. All right. So, next item on the agenda is Maxwell Woods Subdivision. Joel Fitzpatrick doing business as Maxwell Woods LLC is requesting major subdivision review and a resource protection permit for Maxwell Woods, a 38 unit condominium and eight apartment unit development located at 112 through 114 Spronk Avenue. Um, section 16-2-4, major subdivision review, public hearing, and section 19-8-3, resource protection permit, public hearing will be held tonight. Uh, before we open the um, floor for comment, uh, our representative for Joel Owens will, will give an overview of the project and any updates on what you can tell us where you stand on some of the outstanding questions. Certainly. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Owens McCullough, civil engineer with the firm of Sebago Technic. Here tonight on behalf of Wiley Enterprises, uh, Joel Fitzpatrick, who usually is here at these, is uh, away um, on a family a trip, I understand. <laughs> so I'm filling in for him tonight, but uh, he does uh, give his apologies that he's not here. Usually he likes to make these things. I think his wife went out in this case. <laughs> Um, the last tonight, uh, what we're here for uh, is a public hearing on the project. I'm going to give a brief update on a few things and thank everybody for the site walk that we went on on that snowy Saturday morning and snow's almost gone now. So, uh, <laughs> but I certainly think it was helpful to have everybody there and I appreciate the turnout. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, the project uh, which you see up here in the rendering is Maxwell Woods uh, multiplex unit. It's under the open space uh, zoning and the multiplex uh, requirements. Uh, we've made our initial submittal for the project for completeness review. Uh, the project will include uh, 38 uh, condominium units and eight uh, multiplex units for a total of 46 in total. What you see up on the screen is the uh, condominium multiplex portion here, and then the two four unit multiplex buildings here. We're proposing an extension of Astor Lane out to Spurwink Avenue, and then an internal looped road uh, within the development that will be called Maxwell Woods Drive. When we uh, had our site walk on that snowy day we I think we parked over in this general area then we kind of walked down in and down into the development area we had the center line of the road flagged and staked and we walked around the road in this direction here and then we walked down along uh, the extension of Astor Lane which came back out to Spurwink Avenue uh, the project um, I just I have a few graphics here just to refresh everybody so uh, the applicant will be constructing uh, single and duplex units they're single story uh, targeted for uh, the 55 and older group uh, designed for ease of access very similar actually pretty much identical to uh, the Eastman Meadows and Cottage Brook development that's next door uh, again, single story, uh, vinyl siding for ease of maintenance with some architectural um, windows, front porch, uh, two car garage for each of the units and they do have full basements. Uh, this is a standard duplex uh, floor plan and you see the two car garage here and here. Uh, this is the main living space on one floor. There's uh, some options that people can choose such as sunrooms, patios, and dens. Um, those are uh, options that 
folks, you know, in the other developments we've seen, a mix, some people choose for the dens and the sunrooms, others went for the patios. So it does provide some flexibility in the floor plan layout. And again, there are two car garages with enough room in the front of the units, of the driveways for uh, two additional vehicles in, in each location. One of the questions we had at the site walk, I think it was Victoria that asked about the single unit floor plan. Uh, it's up here on the screen, but it will also be included in our next submittal. Uh, but Joel has broken out the uh, single unit plan. So it's identical to the duplex, it's just halved. And you have a two car garage with living kitchen, uh, bed, master bedroom, uh, options for dens and sunroom and patios. Uh, unfortunately, this is a little hard to see, but I'll try to walk you through it. Uh, we also have two floorplex multi-units, and what you see here is the first floor plan and the second floor plan. Um, there'll be stairs. This is a change from the last uh, time we were here. We had this stairway coming off the front of the building, if you remember, that kind of branched off in a T. The applicant never really liked that, thought from a visual standpoint it would be preferable not to have that. Um, the town planner had also commented on that, and I think some of the board members did too. So what uh, Joel has done is had this redrafted so that uh, the stairway is in the back and it is internal. So uh, people will come up to the second floor. There is access on the bottom floor for the lower units and with still a main access to both of the lower apartment units on the front. The access to the second floor apartments will be from the back, which is adjacent to parking areas, so that the front of these uh, apartments face Astor Lane, um, and all of the access and stairs and internals are on the back of it with the parking. This is a uh, elevation view of front and back of the buildings. So this is this is going to be the rear of or I'm sorry the front of the buildings here. Uh, kind of a balcony out front, uh, an entry door here and here with uh, windows and kind of a, a, a barn or a hip style roof on the front, the back which is here. What you're looking at here on this gable end is the internal stairs that come up into the building. So if you're parked out back, you'll see the face of the building. And then if you look at it from the side view, that's the back with the internal stairs that go, go into the back of the unit. So uh, instead of this stairway projecting out, it's now integrated in as part of the building. Um, <clears throat> this last slide is the open space and we're going to provide, there's been some uh, requests when we make our submittal to uh, provide some clearer graphics for uh, the planning board in the next meetings. But what you see here on this slide is kind of the darker green yeah, will remain as the wooded open space. Uh, this over here which didn't come out as well, but that is also open space that we're I think I went to sleep, didn't it? <laughs> Honestly, I'm still awake. <laughs> I am awake. <laughs> Thank you, Maureen. Okay. <laughs> so back over on this open space over here. Uh, that open space is adjacent to the multiplex apartments. It's right up against the town-owned land. The applicant has, since his original submittal, has offered that this land uh, would be given to the town. So since the town owns the open space here, this land then would become part of the town-owned open space. The open space you see around here would remain as part of the association with a public easement over the open space and an integrated trail system that is for the public usage. And that trail system runs around the perimeter of the building, kind of along the bluff, and then um, back over to Astor Lane. We're also providing for a trail connection back into the town open space because there's quite a bit of 
of trail network in this area here. The other thing you see on this is this area here, which is agricultural land that uh, will be integrated into the open space, but it will still be allowed to be maintained as agricultural land, but the de no further development can occur on it. So it's operating agricultural farm land. Uh, the rest of the Maxwell piece is in this area here. This is the pond that's part of the project here. You see in the light green, the open space that is around the perimeter is part of the green belt system. And this is town-owned open space. Uh, Maureen, I, that's, is that, that's, that's, that's the easement. And I know that there's can some continuing dialogue with Canterbury about networks in this area and some potential for up in here. And I didn't show it because that hasn't come to fruition yet, but it is on, it, but I, I believe there's some uh, plans in the works for that. So it really becomes an integrated open space and trail uh, network system. So uh, one of the other questions we had uh, while we were on the site walk was proximity to some of the units on uh, Canterbury Woods. We'll give you some dimensions on the open space plan. Unfortunately, you, that's hard for you to see up there, but I'll, I'll uh, give you some dimensions here, assuming I can read them. Um, so it's about from the close, this unit right here to the, from this unit to the, to the edge of the open space is about 140 feet. Uh, from this unit over here is about 200 feet in that location. You know, the Canterbury buildings are right up against the property line, so if you, there's almost no, when they built that, they almost created no buffer, but we're providing 100 feet or more of separation between the units as part of the open space. The other thing was there was a question, I think, on the site walk on the distance from the back of the condominiums over to the Hamlin Street. That's uh, about 580 feet from the property line over to the Hamlin Street area here. Uh, so there's some pretty good distances involved. We are also in the process of having a traffic study completed. I don't really have an update for you yet. Uh, Diane Morabito of Maine Traffic Consultants is doing that work. Um, I should have uh, some results from that this week. In particular, what was asked was to look at the Ocean House Road and Spurwink Avenue intersection, which she is doing. There's counts that have been done down there. She has also looked at traffic projections, not only from our development, but assuming that uh, the Cottage Brook development will funnel traffic back over to Spurwink Road instead of coming back through um, the Spurwink Woods neighborhood. So she is looking at uh, those um, uh, analysis and trap trip generation. The other thing that was asked, and I've asked her to uh, look at these as traditional condominiums and apartments, even though um, our experience tells us from the other projects that we're seeing it um, <clears throat> mimic more of the um, elder um, condominium units, which has a trip, lower trip generation, but for modeling purposes, since we're not restricting this, we're looking at it for the full traffic, and there's really not a big difference, but uh, we, ha we are looking at that. Um, what we are, look, so looking forward to March after the public hearing, we'll make another submittal with all of the more detailed plans addressing a lot of the notes that uh, folks had at the last meeting, clarifying some of the density and calculations, um, providing more definitive information around that. Landscaping, um, the town, uh, town planner took a preliminary look at the landscaping. Some of the tree species that my landscape architect had wasn't consistent with the landscaping that has been identified by the, the tree warden, is that right? So what we've done is change those to match that. Hopefully we've got that covered for this, uh, for this next submittal. Uh, the project is uh, on public sewer, water, 
underground utilities. Uh, we are not uh, proposing any uh, lighting within the development other than uh, the light front porch lighting. And then you know, if you looked at the image we had before, uh, Joel typically puts a lamp post out in front of each of the units here and there, but there's no formal street lighting. And I think we had a discussion around that on the site walk that the town has moved away from doing a lot of street lighting because um, it's expensive, has to be maintained, uh, but we'll get good neighborhood lighting very similar to what we've done um, in the Eastman Meadows project. <clears throat> Simultaneously with this, we will be um, filing for our main DEP site location of Development Act permit. Uh, we had a public informational meeting here about a month ago. Um, some of the folks who abut the properties who are probably here in the audience will see uh, another notice coming out because we, uh, if you don't file within a month, you have to re-notify folks of when it's actually going in. We decided to wait until we got through uh, the site walk and the public hearing and finished the traffic study. So uh, we'll be re-notifying as required and then we'll be submitting to the DEP. We've already had a pre-application uh, meeting with the Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, Christine Woodruff will be the project manager there for, for this. Stormwater, we did have some discussion about stormwater. I'll just touch on that again. What we're proposing to use is uh, a couple of different methods to treat and detain the stormwater. Those will include underdrained soil filters and will include uh, what they call focal points, which are a um, chambered system with, with filtration. And those are located, I, I can point to, I think one's here, and then we have another one up here. Uh, there's a couple of focal points along here, but those are all designed around the main DEP Chapter 500 regulations. Uh, this project is located within the Trout Brook watershed, so uh, what the applicant will be doing is uh, make, paying a fee under the compensation fee utilization uh, plan, and I think we've done some preliminary calculations of around $25,000. That goes into a fund. Maureen, if I got it right, the town manages that fund. It gets paid to the DEP, but the town, but then I think it gets shuttled to you. We get it. You get it. Some, you, in the end, you get it. So, uh, but it can be used for watershed improvements uh, within the area. Uh, so with that, uh, we're here for the public hearing, then we'll be back for in March, hopefully for the preliminary review, and then following through the process for final plan review. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, before I open the public hearing, uh, just to, the way it works is uh, anyone who would like to speak or is welcome. Uh, can I ask a question before this? Uh, the presentation? Okay. Do you mind? Uh, why don't we wait until after the public hearing? We can discuss this in more detail after, All right. after we hear. Just, it was just brought up, so I, I, I have a question about it. So why don't we wait till after the public hearing and let the public have their say, and we can, and we can discuss after that's done. All right. Okay. That's the usual practice. So um, you come to the podium, state your name and address. You don't have to say it's in Cape Elizabeth. We assume that. <laughs> So, um, and you don't have to give you zip code because we know that. Uh, and you have th three minutes. Maureen will be timing. So when you hear a ding, 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 if you haven't wrapped up, please do uh, as quickly as you can. And if there are a lot of people who want to speak to facilitate it and to save time, I would ask that you please line up rather than having somebody sit down and us having to wait for people to shuffle around. So. I ask that you please line up and uh, take your turns. So, all right, public hearing is now open on this particular project. So, would anyone like to speak? Okay. Got someone who's going to start it off. Hi, Paul Seidman, 21 Oak View Drive. A really simple uh, question pertaining to um, traffic study. So, I'm glad that sort of hasn't been done yet. 
Um, it's regarding the Ocasisco School, and so I was wondering if the traffic study would include not just the intersection, but also how that impacts the school. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hi. Hi, David Cummings, 99 Sparwink Avenue. Um, my concern is about the traffic uh, sight lines and visibility coming from 77 down Spurwink. Um, I live across the street from Petrina Owen, who is the closest abutter to the proposed Astor Lane extension. Uh, I spoke with Owen a month or so ago about the sight lines coming through there. Now the speed limit is posted at 30 miles an hour, but I can assure you that not too many people drive 30 miles an hour down Spurwink. Obviously, the speed limit, the, the people are driving closer to 50 than, than 30, I would say, on average. From Petrina's property line to the proposed road is 127 feet. Now, if you're coming down Spurwink from 77, there's a rise in the road, a descent, and you're down around the corner. Owen has told me that they're going to remove a big ledge there and take out all the trees which will improve the visibility tremendously. I happen to be a golf course architect, so I'm pretty good at seeing through the trees what isn't there yet. Um, and I have my little wheel. So I have wheeled out several times to see realistically, coming down Spurwink, what point are you going to be able to see a car exiting the proposed Astor Lane extension? You could argue all night, whether it's 180 or 195, whatever feet. But I think you have to take into consideration that we do have snow banks, and Petrina on occasion has visitors. Just last week, she had family in town for the whole week, and there's a van parked in her driveway. You have 180 feet of visibility with that car parked there. Now, just a quick Google search online will tell you average distances for cars to stop. It's a very simple math, very easy. 30 miles an hour, you take the 30 and times it by the first digit, three, 90 feet. 40 miles an hour, 160 feet. 50 miles an hour, 250 feet. That's in a good reaction time, brand new tires, clean surface, and tires perfectly at tire pressure. So that means at 45 miles an hour, you don't realistically have a chance to stop in a car in perfect conditions. Not to mention, no offense, but the school buses and the snow plows go a lot faster than 30 miles an hour. Now my daughter is gonna be riding a school bus in a couple years, and you can't ask me to put her on a school bus that's coming out of that road when there's no chance to see her until you're 180 feet from her. I don't know the distances of pickup trucks or dump trucks or snow plows or uh, surfaces that are wet or snowy or foggy or rainy, I have no idea. But you just simply do not have time to react to stop. So I suggest that you yourselves go out and drive down the road. It's easy to see where the 127 feet is. That's a little driveway that they used to use to go to the alpacas. It's just past the um, David, fire line. Right. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I, I want you each to go by. Do not pull down into the road where the alpacas are, where the proposed road is to come out because it's not safe. But drive back and forth a couple times just so you can see for yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Andrew Gilbert, uh, 32 Astor Lane. I just have a couple things. Um, I'm a wildlife biologist, so I think a lot about landscapes. And um, my biggest concern with the development, and I'm not opposed to development. I mean, I actually live on Astor Lane. Uh, so uh, really, I know the town has you know, tried to plan for open space and connectivity of open space and things like that, which I think is great. And I think it's, there's a lot of forethought in that. Looking at this development, I've always been concerned about the you know, the connection right now, if you look at the, I guess that would be, is this north-south oriented, <coughs> this map? Um, I don't think it is, actually. I think it's east, east-west. So uh, the east side, so uh, 
line, bordering the new Cottage Brook condominiums, that, that buffer there with, where there's a trail, um, basically it gets cut down to almost nothing. And you could argue that it's unlikely that any trees remaining in that buffer are gonna stand based on what we saw with the clear cutting in Cottage Brook. And I mean, formally right now, there's a, you know, that whole, that's a big forest, so there's a lot of connection with Canterbury Woods and then other open space for wildlife and whatnot, to particularly through and to where the apartments are to the, op the other piece of open space that's basically kind of a, a wet area um, that borders Hamlin and Spurwing. Basically, if you create a buffer that's, it's not very big um, where the trail is on the east side bordering the two developments, it, you're effectively cutting that, um, that quarter down to almost nothing. The west side, you know, that seems pretty reasonable to me just sort of on the face of it, but uh, you're, you're basically gonna have enough for a path and that's about it. And so you've, and, and so if you're forcing animals or whatever to come along the west side there, now they're gonna have to either go through this other piece of land that may or may not be developed bordering the pond and then crossing the road and through an apartment complex. Um, you know, again, I, I, I don't, I kind of feel like that wasn't well thought out, this, uh, this buffer between the two and that there should have been a little more space added to that. I also think that in the end, that east side and I think what's the south, well, the south side will have, actually have trees left because there's gonna border spur wing, but um, a lot of the, the native trees, which we all know if you went on the, the walk, there's a lot of old growth um, that's standing there that'll basically be gone. So I, the other, my other thing that I would request is as much of the original trees, the older trees, there's, there's still a fair amount of new growth too, um, be kept as much as possible. Um, I actually don't think you see that much of the mixed uh, conifer forest like you do um, around town. So uh, that's basically it, thanks. Thank you. Hello, I'm Becky Fernald from Mitchell Road. Uh, and my, uh, my concern is, has to do with the open space that's been designated in this development. Um, I went to the earlier planning board meeting where there was a, um, the, um, it, it was dis, um, discussed about the 45% and apparently the road would, had been originally included in that. Um, I'm not clear if there is the 45% now in this designation. My concern is that when a development, the cluster developments are um, designed, that the open space meets the zoning ordinance. And um, I was reviewing the ordinance, 163, uh, section 1631, um, and this is, uh, section G, on, it's page 20. It says, the applicant, whenever practical, shall be required to preserve natural features such as water courses or bodies, existing trees of 10 inches or more in diameter, that's their base height, um, and other striking topographic features, which if preserved would add to the attractiveness of the subdivision. The way the open space is designed now would be cutting down many of those old growth um, pine trees that are well, much, much big, bigger than uh, 10 inches across, uh, probably th at least three feet across. Um, and I think that would be destroying some of the natural beauty of that area. Uh, I would hope that the open space would be designed in such a way to provide uh, maximum attractiveness and aesthetic quality to the people, especially to the people living around there. Seems the way it's designed now, there's just a narrow buffer between um, two other um, cluster developments. So you're, uh, if somebody is moving into this area, they're gonna be looking out at um, a whole sea of um, condominiums. Uh, I think the comprehensive plan also um, 
speaks very clearly about the reasons people move to Cape Elizabeth is for its physical beauty and for open space. And 16.31H um, <clears throat> is conformity with local ordinances. Uh, number one is comprehensive plan. I'm not sure this is in keeping with the spirit of the comprehensive plan. I know there's a lot of talk about working in partnership with land trust, with conservation commission, in developing open spaces. And I was, I don't know whether the developer has met with the Conservation Commission and Land Trust to partner on designating open space. And also, if I could just say 16.31, number three is multiplex housing. It says it should be so designed and sited and laid out to minimize disturbance of existing topography and ground cover and pro provide maximum usable natural or improve open space. And I think that is my main concern is that the open space that's been designated is not the most desirable for the um, people living there um, and not in keeping with the zoning ordinances. And one last thing is there are vernal pools, I believe, on the property, and I think a vernal pool assessment will need to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, Emily Hellison at 11 Hamlin. We were right at the other side of that line that Owens drew. I just have a couple uh, comments. I was reading through the 2013 Greenbelt Plan and found it interesting that it said that what Cape Elizabeth considers desirable open space is um, acquisitions that maintain the rural character, preserve wildlife habitat, encourage a diversity of plants and animals, and add land to continuous existing preserved space. And when reviewing the proposed project compared to that, it doesn't really seem to jive very well. Um, the, pro the project is providing 45% open space, but I don't think that most of it's actually the type of open space that is envisioned in the Greenbelt plan. Um, the development's gonna be cutting down a really large old growth forest. And as we all saw during the site walk, the woods are beautiful. They're older than all of us, and it's really gonna be a shame if they all are just cut down. Um, if it moves forward, I would just love to see them preserve more of those trees, more of the woods around the trails, um, and also just some of the, really the old trees to actually allow the feeling of being in nature when walking on the trails. Um, a lot of those trees, the top part there, are actually gonna be cut down, even though it looks like they're still there. Um, Joel told us that because a lot of them will fall down. So. Really, it's just gonna be condos on both sides and a trail in the middle, and that's not really a good feeling when you're walking your dog or riding your bike. You're really in people's backyards. Um, so I would just love to see a bigger buffer um, there and also down by the apartment buildings. Because like Andrew was saying, um, there's a lot of deer and owls and birds in these woods, and we actually see tracks almost every day in our backyard um, of deer that are making their way from Trout Brook to the Canterbury Woods. And um, once the apartment building's there, they won't have anywhere to go. And then my last um, concern was just about the trail development. Um, uh, Cottage Brook was what they cut for it about a year and a half ago, and the trails have still not been reestablished. There's one trail that we walked on for a couple minutes in the sidewalk that one of the neighbors actually put back in after the clear cut. Um, and because of that, there's a big um, trail corridor from Spurwink up to Canterbury that's really heavily used. And so my concern also is that once all of the, these trees are gone, if they come in and clear cut, will there be trails for us to use during development? And just I'd like to know the time frame of putting those back in. Thank you. Thank you. Is that it? All right. Quickly. <laughs> you were, I, I was about to hammer it closed. So is, the, is there anyone else who wants to speak after this, this lady? If there is, I ask you to please get up and form a line. So we know Sorry. in the end comes. Sorry, so, Thank you. Um, I'm Margaret Gill. I live at number seven, Canterbury Way. And um, w when you see the juxtaposition, obviously, of this extremely dense uh, 
development next to Canterbury, you have the perception that Canterbury must be surrounded by acres and acres, which is not the case. There are 32 units there. So just the density of what's attempt, you know, Maxwell, what I call Maxwell without woods, is attempting to put in there is alarming to me. But what I really want to get back to is that um, I was in Portland for 30 years and then moved to, to Cape Elizabeth, what we refer to as the country when you live in Portland. And I came over the bridge and in no more than six months, the country started to disappear. First the horses went, I asked my next door neighbor, where did they go? She's an equestrian. Well, they're in Durham now, because as a matter of fact, this farm that's been here for 100 years is gone and it's going to be developed. Bad news all around. Um, but this isn't getting much coverage. What I'm reading about in the paper continuously is a little triangle of land on Ocean House Road and a sign that says, welcome to Cape Elizabeth. This seems to be causing a lot of consternation that those trees are going to be cut down and that sign apparently is going to be removed. Actually, Cape Elizabeth starts at least three miles up, very close to Canterbury, as a matter of fact. That's welcome to Cape Elizabeth. So why are we so concerned about cutting down what looks to me like maybe a quarter of an acre less of property and not concerned about what's going to happen within these 18 acres. Um, the reason that the public is concerned in Cape Elizabeth is because that's supposed to be the symbol of life in Cape Elizabeth. You're coming to the country. Welcome to Cape Elizabeth. Oops, taking down the trees, countryside, you know, ugly houses popping up like mushrooms in a field. And so I think that I just would ask the committee and the planning board and those in charge to think about what they really believe life in, in Cape Elizabeth is supposed to be about. Um, we have a small vestige of the rural life left here in Cumberland. It once dominated the state. It defined the state. It defined us as Mainers. It's disappearing. It's our heritage. It's our culture. I'd like to see it protected. Thank you. All right, last call. Anyone? All right, I declare the public hearing closed. Does the board have any comment or questions? Henry. Yes, it's a question about the multiplex. Um, when you put it up, it's on two floors, right? There's four apartments in each. It wasn't to know where the parking was. I didn't see the gar garage in there. And it appeared that the cars were parked at the opposite end of the building for the entrance. So I'm obviously reading it wrong or looking at it wrong. Perhaps you could explain it to me. With your permission. <clears throat> um, so there's the units right there, the building units. There and there. The parking is out behind the units. So um, the tenants would drive in and they would pull in and park behind the units. There are no garages associated with the apartments or the multiplex apartments, but there is parking on the back. And I believe following the design guidelines, it's pref uh, preferable to have the parking out back and not in front. So we tried to follow that line of thinking. So where's the entrance? So I get out of my car at the back of the building. Is there, a, is there a rear entrance that I can walk through or do I have to go out to the front of the building? No, so on the back of the entrance, on the back side, so this is where you drive around and park, there are entrances into the lower units from the back and then stairs to the upper units that you would go up in the back. There's also entrances in the front and there'll be a sidewalk from... Which, sorry? Uh, there'll be a sidewalk from the, fr around the front of the building to get in. So forgive me, is it in excess of 55? Um, on be walking up and down the stairs, and that's, a, I assume the other one's a one story, what we would call a bungalow in England, or a, um, here you've got two stories and you're gonna walk up, at, and it's a 55 year old, or better, um, you're marketing too. I, I just wanted to clarify that. So the apartments are not intended to be 
Um, well, none of the units on this development are age restricted. However, the condominiums are built around the 55 and older. The apartments or the multiple two story are not centered around that. There might be, could be young professionals moving into it. It could be um, folks that um, want to rent and live in an apartment in Cape Elizabeth. But <clears throat> that demographic is not intended to be 55 and older in the apartments. Any other questions? Victoria? Um, a couple of things that I heard um, from the public. I heard somebody mention Vernal Pool. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any, um, anything to say about uh, the, whether or not a Vernal Pool exists on this property? Yes, Longview um, Associates, and in the original submittal that we had turned in, going through completeness review, included a wetland delineation from Longview uh, consultants and also a vernal pool assessment. <clears throat> in addition, we have filed paperwork with Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, and that paperwork is in that submittal too, and Inland Fisheries and Wildlife did not note any significant wildlife habit habitats, including vernal pools on the property. Okay, thank you. Certainly. Go ahead. Um, another question was, somebody was saying, if you were to, there will be, as we know, there's a proposed trail between um, the two subdivisions that Mr. Patak, uh, Dole has done. Sure. Right up there, yes, thank you. Welcome. And if a significant amount of trees do come down, I think the person was asking um, how walking between these people's backyards, how are you going to distinguish that this is actually a trail and you're not walking um, on grass that mm -hmm. appears to be just somebody's backyard? How will you distinguish that there is a trail system there? So the trails will be uh, formalized. My understanding is, is while they are designed around low impact trails, by that I mean not paved or, or hard trails, they do tend to develop those features uh, through use on the trails. Joel will be constructing that so that it is defined. And we've been talking about adding some features such as landscaping and signage along there to help guide those folks that are along those trails. Okay, and my last question is, um, as far as when can people start walking on these trails, um, am I, what are you proposing? Are you proposing that trails go in after every home is built and sold, or a trail's gonna go in as portions are built and sold, or the trail's get, going to go in? What point, what staging, sure. is this a phasing? I'd like to know more about that. So my expectation would be initially around safety more than anything to pedestrians on the site. So when the contractor mobilizes and comes in and builds the roadway and the utility infrastructure, there's a lot of equipment moving around on the site. So uh, we probably wouldn't be doing any construction of the trails until that activity stops. Now, for this project, Joel, uh, unlike some of the other projects he's done, this is all going to be built in one phase. The infrastructure will be built in one phase. It'll obviously take several years to build all of the units. Uh, but the road, the sewers, the utilities, all of that infrastructure will be put in place. If approvals went such that we could get started in July, um, June, July, my expectation would be um, that most of that infrastructure work could be completed by in this construction season. So then I think the trails would come after that because at that point it moves from um, the mass grading of the roads and utility infrastructure to building the individual units. And I think the amount of equipment, the amount of activities on the site would then be safer. And I will talk to Joel about that. Unfortunately, he's not here today, but my expectation would be then that those trails would be built at that point. Thank you. Jonathan? Well, one of the questions I have is on, and actually it's more of a concern, is along the same lines of what Victoria was just asking about, is that buffer between the, um, the development that's going in now and Maxwell Woods. When we went on that site walk, it was sort of concerning to me how close those two are going to be. And from when we went to what is uh, Cottage Brook now and parked there and then walked into the new development, I really think realistically when 
that infrastructure project starts going in, that you are not going to have any sort of buffer whatsoever left over between Cottage Brooks and Maxwell Woods. I, and I know realistically that's how it happens because as Joel explained on the site walk, some of these trees are going to have to come down. Yes, they will. And so when you walk into that development, when you drive into that development, it's going to be the same looking condos for basically all the eye, from what, where the eye can see, basically you're going to have four rows, if not more, struck up all the way um, to the end until the trees that are going to be planted grow. Um, so one of the things that I think needs to happen is either one, we get a, a guarantee from the uh, applicant that once the infrastructure goes in that that buffer between the two pr projects basically is created first and that trail system gets put in or what I think might be a better suggestion is for somehow is maybe we sc they scale the applicant scales back the project and maybe loses a couple of those units so that you can allow more room between where Cottage Brook ends and Maxwell Woods begins so that some of that buffer that exists now can actually stay. I mean, I don't know if that's been something that's been brought up or, but it, when we were on that project and looking, obviously it's sort of abstract when you're walking in the woods in the snow and you're only following where the stakes are, but it really was concerning to see, because it was, it was right there how close that buffer is, and, and that's a real concern that I have. Uh, and I, I know we're, that might be a little bit, it took me actually being out there to see how close these are and realistically how I don't, I don't see how there really is going to be a buffer at this point or something along those lines of maybe we could try to move the project back from where Maxwell Woods ends and or where the two lines are. Something that would kind of maintain and try to save some of that natural buffer that's there now. So I, that's just one of the concerns that I had, and I don't know if that's a realistic option, but I think it's something that we should we could consider, and it's something that came to me when we were on that sidewalk. So, so Joel is developing both projects. Um, while they're different, separate condominiums, uh, my expectation would be that they would uh, operate as a community, similar to maybe how these units back up to these units or two units across from each other. There's the front from this unit to this unit is, uh, is similar to the, well, actually less than the units between these two here. The only difference is there isn't really a road coming down through it. So um, it's really an integrated uh, development of similar construction. Um, I, I understand that, but one of the selling points it seemed that was being said to us is that you guys are going to be doubling the amount of open space because of, because of that corridor going between the two. But to me, it's a concern if what's the point of opening open space if it's going to get mowed down anyway. So that's why one of the reasons that I think we need something to show that the open space, especially in that area, is going to be given a priority to basically be set back up as a buffer in an open space that the town will be able to enjoy as opposed to if, it's, if there's no growth there, it's gonna feel like you're walking between or in the backyard of two different condominiums. So that's, one, that's a concern that I have about what we saw out there on that sidewalk. Did you have something? Yeah, I had an <clears throat> unrelated question. Can you? comment on the uh, comment made about the site distance being inadequate? So this project, the site distance out here on the road, and we've said this all along that we're going to have to remove ledge and area here and trim trees along here to achieve the town required site distance. The town within their ordinance, Appendix E, um, has prescriptive site distances uh, that are requirements for uh, projects, local roads are 125 feet or 150 feet. And we will comply. Um, 
I, I wish I could remember off the head. What did Bob Malley classify that? Was that a feeder or was that the local road? I just don't it's remember. What's that? It's in the ordinance. I know I don't have that with me. <laughs> Uh, but we will be we will be designing to meet those prescriptive requirements set forth in the ordinance. It's a rural connector. So that is uh, the rural connector. Uh, minimum intersection safe distance is 200 feet. That's correct. So we will be uh, meeting that requirement. And it does require moving uh, ledge and rock on that, on that, on the front. But we will, we do need to meet that, and we will show that we're meeting that requirement. Any questions over the side? Go ahead, Peter. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the uh, back to the trees for a minute. The stretch of the Astor Road extension as, as it approaches Spurwick has. Uh, quite a growth of fairly large pine trees. And on the site walk, uh, as you or Joel was pointing out that the grade of, of um, asteroid extension would have to come up quite a bit it to does. permit the, the uh, flow of uh, sewage. And so with the addition of fill and the proximity to those trees, they were pretty much going to be casualties of the road and would have to come down anyway. Was that, do I have that correct? So there's down, this plan fairly uh, shows fairly accurately the limits of the grading which are kind of down in this area through here and down and around the corner this this area right there is where we have to put in a stormwater uh, uh, under drain soil filter for treating the stormwater from the road and one thing we have done that you'll see on the next set of plans I'll see if I can show it. you see this kind of cleared area that runs through here mm -hmm. there was an outlet pipe that I had to put in from the under drain soil filter down to the lower outlet elevation and we've changed that to run it back along the road this direction within the area we're clearing for the side slope so that we don't have to clear that area where that pipe was going to keep more of that buffering in through there. So there still will be a very significant amount of wooded area that's retained in, in along here. There will be a retaining wall on, along this side of the pond, but we're able to achieve most of it through sloping on this side of the pond. We will all the trees uh, between the asteroid extension and the farm pond will basically have to go? Between and the farm pond, yes. There's no way of saving them. Those big trees that are along there, they're right in the middle of, of, you know, we would be putting five, six feet fill right around the base of those trees, and unfortunately we wouldn't be able to, they just wouldn't survive. But. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, Maureen, um, how much leeway does the planning board have in what these buildings look like? Actually, um, the, the planning board and the council worked very hard on a package of land use amendments. And the land use amendments actually have dramatically expanded the planning board's authority to review the architecture for multiplex dwellings. Mm -hmm. So if you go to section 1972, I think it's an extra six pages, there's illustrations. Um, the, the architectural requirements are similar to what the board is used to working with yeah. uh, for the town center. So you actually do for almost the first time have a lot to say about how the buildings look. Okay. Could you put that slide back up, the apartment buildings, please? Sure. Oh, the the uh, elevations, the outside. Yes. Yeah. Um, I grew up in Kansas. We're not in Kansas. <laughs> Okay. Um, the barn things, my recommended to lose them because I don't, I just don't think they're attractive. I think the windows should have shutters on them, make it more New England like. That's my opinion. Dress up the buildings. Uh, just what kind of siding is it going to be again? Yes, these will be vinyl, uh, By clapboard. clapboard? Side. Yes, and with some shakes. He usually mixes in some of the vinyl shakes to, um, if you. I can show you kind of what, oops, where'd it go? Yeah, okay. So he'll, he'll change some of the, uh, the trim details and 
Um, I've roof seen roof. the Maxwell Woods. Those, I mean, they look fine. It's just the apartment buildings are trying to look like okay. something they're not, in my opinion. Again, uh, I don't know what okay. the rest of the board feels like on that. That's my opinion. Um, um, I go to also my opinion in the application more than once. Uh, the applicant touts as an advantage the lack of impact it will have on the schools. To me, that's a negative. We've got uh, the demographics of Cape Elizabeth, essentially like me, getting older, that you're gone. And uh, my opinion, we should have more affordable units that could have more kids and increase the number of schools. But again, that's my opinion, and I'm not sure we can do anything about that because Joel's crunched the numbers and he needs those units probably to make the project pay for itself and make a buck. But well, um, to me, that's a negative, not having, uh, targeting towards the over 55. And I can say that because I am. <laughs> uh, I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> so that, I guess I'm echoing what other people have said, the trees are essentially gone, except for the, uh, in the south part of the development where there's enough cover where they all, the w big wind comes up, they won't all blow down. But pretty much like, uh, like you said over there, it's gonna be looking from one building into another. There's gonna be no trees until the ones you plant, mm -hmm. you know, a couple of decades down the line get big enough to, to cover them. Um, have all the Maxwell, I mean, all the Eastman Meadows, are there still some for sale from the original? I, I believe think. there's one single unit left that he will be, I think, I think it's actually built or under construction, but yeah. there, it's pretty well built out. And there might be one unit in so there. So that's within five years, six years? I, I can't remember how long that's been. Well, the project uh, really got going in earnest around, I want to say 2000. 10, 11 yeah. or so, yeah. because uh, we came in originally through the approvals in 08. Um, obviously, the economic conditions slowed down, so Joel sat on it for a year or two. Boy, I, I, you know, it feels to me like it was 10, 11 that it really got going. Is he going to build some on spec and see if they sell, or is he going to wait to sell them and then build them? So usually what he does is he comes in and builds... Uh, uh, a show unit, and uh, then from there um, he builds um, the each individual unit as they're sold. So somebody would come in and put a reservation down on a unit, and they would say, "We want, we want this unit in this location." So, you know, people come in and look and say, "Geez, we really like that unit right there. That's where we want to be," and then. Joel work with them on whether they have a sunroom, a deck, or a patio, you yeah. know, the add-ons, and then he'll, be, he'll build specific to that. Some of them want a finished basement, some of them don't. So he, he works with them and builds tailored to each customer that comes in. Okay. Are you set? Yes, I'm all set. Maureen has something. I just wanted to suggest that the board may want to direct the applicant to provide a written explanation of how they meet the architectural standards that are in 1972 um, that's in your multiplex provisions that just got adopted that seem reasonable we are working on that thank you <laughs> I assume that work, might be asked. a lot of work to do between now and, and March um, I do want to agree I'm, I'm not sure if I was the only one and now I'm hearing I'm not the only one that was going to ask you to please defend how those apartment buildings meet our standards. Um, I don't see where they meet the standards. I echo exactly what Jim was saying. Um, I have a lot of concerns about how they look and how they meet our standards of fitting in. Um, they just don't seem to. They just, uh, I would go back to your firm put in a very nice eight unit condo on Woodland Road. It's beautiful. 
I, and then I look at this, and I know you guys can do better. Because well, it fits. I, I, right I just want to be clear, I'm the civil guy, I'm not the architect. <laughs> I'm just the civil guy. It's one, it's one giant building. I don't know if it takes up less square footage. Um, I don't know if, if two, you know, two better than the one, um, but it has eight units, fits in, you probably already have the specs on file. I wouldn't cost too much, you know, just kind of like, take a look at this. I am, but on a serious, I am deeply sure. concerned with how you are going to defend that what you are proposing fits into the Cape Elizabeth. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you. Yeah. Jonathan? Was, was there a specific reason that the road is going where it is? I know the two entrances um, were done for a specific reason. But where it kind of comes around along the the border with Cottage Brook, that basically makes such a small buffer between those areas. I mean, was it was it done to maximize the amount of units that can be placed on the project? I mean, it makes economical sense. I'm not trying to say that's a bad thing. Um, but is there any reason geographically or topographically that that was done? Uh, well, there's probably several reasons because when we start this process it, it starts with a lot of different s schemes and options and alternatives and then we start to plug in the topography uh, the grades the slopes of the roads how those roads um, work within the natural or within the topography and how much land grading and it all sort of culminates to uh, work around the cuts and fills and maintain reasonable slope grades and maintain um, uh, decent uh, or reasonable slopes between the units. What you don't see on this plan is the grading, and I probably should have included it, but there's quite a bit of grade drop from the backs of these units down to these units, some pretty good sized slopes. So if we, I, I think what you're saying is if we came over and we had moved the road and pushed these right up to here, there's literally 30 or 40 feet of grade change across the site. So uh, we had to stretch out the road in order to address the grades in between the units. Uh, but there's a grading plan. Actually, somebody commented to me on the site walk about all those grading lines that were on the plan. And basically, that's why, in order to make up the grades. And we are integrating in stone walls to try to uh, address some of those grades. Um, Joel likes to do a lot of the stone walls on it. Now, was there any option when you when you started looking at this project to uh, create more of a buffer area-wise between Cottage Brooks and Maxwell Woods? Not without shifting everything. Uh, I guess it would be easterly down towards the Canterbury Pines development. Okay. But at, at all times it was the, we're going to give 49% of the open space and... Well, it's 40, a little over, I don't know, a little over 45%, I think, is what is what we have in it. One thing Joel started from the beginning was in this area here, this trail, there's quite a bit of topographical drop in this area, within this wooded area. He wanted to try to preserve that slope. And, and run the trail system so it kind of ran, ran along the ridge of this, I'll call it a bluff, a small bluff, uh, to overlook the pond and the agricultural field. So um, that was an objective early on. And, you know, simply to have moved all this building down this way would have had um, significant impacts on the amount of cuts uh, in, the, in the building and obviously you know, would have lost a lot of that buffer down here at the Canterbury, um, Canterbury uh, condominium project. So we were trying to balance a lot of different things. Okay. And and it was built you it. said it was 45 percent then? Yeah, uh, it's, I can tell you, it's... So we were required to have the parcels 18.17 uh, acres, 45 percent is 8.18 acres, we're providing 8.46 acres, so um, a quarter of acre more than the 45 percent. Is that your new density numbers? Yeah, um, I have them on the plan, but they'll be on the, uh, 
An interesting thing too, where uh, when we were looking at the ordinance and recalculating it, because we, we, you know, we had this whole discussion at the last meeting about, I might as well just show you now. So we've deducted out all these roads through here. We deducted out this roads through here. We deducted out the parking that's behind the units. We've deducted out, um, uh, well, there's no wetlands to deduct because we have no RP1 wetlands on the site. The only wetland is down here and we're not impacting it. Um, so that gave us, and then uh, that gave us uh, a total of like 15.82, which comes out to be 46 units that's allowed. We're proposed 46. However, within the ordinance, uh, there is any agriculture, the town has put a higher value on agricultural land. And within the ordinance, you get a density bonus of one unit per 30,000 square feet of preserved agricultural land. And it turns out that gives us additional three units of density. So we actually could put 49. We're not proposing that, but um, we're actually allowed to have 49 in total. Yeah, I picked up on that. I'm going to put out a suggestion for the future because I don't think any time between now and our next meeting is, is appropriate. But I think at some point it, after that, it might be appropriate to have a site walk without snow on the ground. So you can better see that grade that he's talking about. And I remember climbing it in the snow, but you know, can, we can really appreciate more what the grade is. So I would think after the next submission, we might want to consider doing that. Yes. You know, the <coughs> It's obviously, <coughs> pardon me, a lot of sensitivity about the, uh, you know, the buffering or lack of buffering uh, along the property line adjacent to Cottage Brook. And, you know, certainly I think most people understand why a lot of those trees will come down for construction reasons and because of the grade between the two properties, it's maybe not ideally suited for a restoration of the old buffering of high growth, you know, high trees. But I would almost suggest you think about proposing some kind of a landscaping scheme in there that might might work. It doesn't necessarily have to be large trees. I mean, there are a lot of rhododendron, azalea, shrubs mm -hmm. of that nature that would create a visual uh, transition between the two properties and, and break up the sight lines. And uh, I, I think there's probably a lot of stuff you could think about doing that would assuage some of the concerns you've hear, heard here. Just I, when I looked at it, I could see that the, the tree line wasn't really effectively, but there is a lot of planting you can do, I think, that is attractive and, and does exist in, in properly uh, sited adjacent or extension um, subdivisions. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Yeah, I, first of all, I agree completely with Peter. I think that if you had some sort of contingency uh, landscaping plan to deal with that that would be great um, my other question is is there um, some number of units you could lose before this project becomes financially unfeasible for you well, I don't know that I'm the right person to answer that <laughs> that's really well, a, a question for Joel question so question that you might yeah give to Joel I'm not yep. sure that's something he'd want to answer off the cuff either. No, but I will, I will have a conversation with him. So. Anything else? Can we let Owens go? <laughs> <laughs> He's Thank saying you. please. Yeah. I, I love He's got work to do. <laughs> I got work to do. Thank He's you. He's got a lot of work to do if he's going to make that submission. We do have a motion. We do have, need a motion. Would someone like to make it? Mm -hmm. Thank you for your time. Oh, sorry. I just want to make sure the public is aware that now that the public hearing has been held, we won't be sending more notices. So this item will continue to appear on the planning board agenda. If you're wondering if the planning board's going to be hearing on it, you should check the town's website. Um, if you go to the meetings calendar portion of the website, you can look up the planning board agenda. It's about five days before the meeting. If you can't figure out how to do that or you forget to do it, you can always call me and ask me, is this on the agenda? I just want to make sure people know you can still come to the meeting. There's still an opportunity for public comment, but the portion of the process where we're mailing notices is now done for a while. Thank you. Thanks. And the date of that meeting will be? The next meeting is March 21st. 
Go ahead, Peter. Uh, motion for the board to consider be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Maxwell Woods LLC for a major subdivision review and a resource protection permit for Maxwell Woods, a 38 unit condominium and eight unit apartment development located at 112 to 114 Spurwick Ave be tabled to the regular March 21st, 2017 meeting of the planning board. Second. Second. Any other comments? All those in favor? Opposed? Well, oh, we're unanimous, so no one's opposed. And I. She's out of All right. <laughs> The next item on the agenda is Holt Private Road Review. Dr. William Holt is requesting a private road review to upgrade his existing driveway to provide frontage for a new lot to be created at the end of Running Taking County Road, side? section 19-7-9, and we will be discussing oh, okay. so that like completeness. And like I said, I don't know why, but it, it, right here is the best place to play with it. There you go. Here. That's what you want, right? Yep, right there. Thank you. It's there. Okay, so it's right there. Yep. And we can grab that. Could you please be a little more expeditious? We have another item before us. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Hi there. You ready? Good evening, Chair Jordan, members of the board. I'm Bob Metcalf with Mitchell Associates, for those of you who don't know me, here representing Dr. Holt. Good with us this evening is uh, Bill Dale from Jensen Baird. Uh, I know this is partly for completeness. I had sent you a letter uh, based on some discussions that had come through from uh, Steve Harding, and I'll go through those afterwards, but I'll walk you through the proposal for the, the project. Uh, first, I'd like to just clarify something since the board saw this at workshop session when John Mitchell brought it forward. Uh, had been looking at creating uh, a new lot up in here that also included a portion of the property on the other side. That has been taken off and when I get into the actual layout for the lot, I will go over that with you. Uh, as far as existing conditions, I uh, just want to go over this is the balance of the Holt property, which is the remaining parent parcel that we're talking about. Uh, the existing asphalt driveway that comes in off a running tide, it's a 10 foot wide driving surface that comes down and up to the turnaround at the front of the, the Holt residence. Uh, there's an existing gravel tote road that runs through the property, continues all the way down on the previous sections that you had looked at and then beyond on an abutting property. It gives vehicular access uh, down through the property and over to the Duffet property, which is a seasonal cottage that's landlocked on this corner here. Existing utilities, uh, the water district has an extended eight inch main that comes down to roughly in this location. And the uh, domestic water service for the house comes off of that. There's a four inch existing sewer that comes in off the, just by the wet well for the sewer pump station that comes up and follows up along the existing driveway and then ties into a manhole out here in the driveway back into the house. Power and other, other, other underground utilities all run down along this side of the roadway to a transformer here and then onto the house. Uh, the town owns this parcel in here, which is where the sewer pump station is and it's a easement to the town that comes in off of this driveway as well that gets access into the pump station. Uh, in terms of the site conditions, 
We have RP1 wetland, which is along this designated area in here. And we have RP2 wetland in this section here that includes part of the pond. And then there's another section of RP2 wetland here, and then a small finger of coastal wetland in this location. Uh, as far as current use of the property, this area over in here is all wooded. That is another RP2 wetland. I'm sorry, I missed that one. Uh, this area in here, which is lightly shaded, is all currently mowed or main, mowed open field, as well as lawn area across the front of the house to the water. And then it's a combination of wooded and a shrub scrub uh, vegetative cover that comes in along with the RP1, RP2 wetland, and then back up into the field area up in here. Can I ask a question, Bob? Sure. Uh, the shading. Yes. Uh, is is the blue outline what indicates the RP1 wetland, or is it the shade, the tan shading, or the greenish, whatever color that is? Well, the color looks better on my screen than it does up on the wall. Because it looks a lot yeah. like up above the same shading is used above yeah. the tote road. Is is that also RP1? No. Okay. This this heavier line in here, the darker, indicates the edge of the vegetation itself, which is more trees and shrub scrub type of vegetation. I didn't discern between the two different types of vegetation. This, that shows up mine as a lighter green. This area in here is what is currently maintained as mowed. Uh, it had a portion of the vineyard that was located in this, roughly in this area in here. And above the tote road, that shaded area. Right, and this is still also part of this area is mowed, uh, maintained open, and then this is where the tree line starts. So it's the tree line that it's indicating. Exactly. Okay, and then comes around. Uh, regarding the setbacks on the property from the RP1, with the 250-foot setback, essentially, from the RP1 wetland, that is the outline of where that 250-foot setback from the RP1 falls on this property. And as you can see, it crosses over onto abutting land as well. That tote road also uh, provides pedestrian access to a number of properties that are along the side of the property. Uh, the only vehicular access over the tote road, as I indicated, is to serve the Duffet property. And this access by, for pedestrian use comes down along the tote road, comes around the front of the, uh, the property, and as you can see in this area right in here, that's defined as where the easement that serves and comes over to ultimately the Duffet is also the area that has pedestrian access that gets down to the beach area in here. Uh, the tote road itself is only gravel surface up until you get to the paved driveway right now. Beyond that, it is all grassed. And uh, when the Duffets use that for access to come here, they just drive over the lawn area uh, to get out to do the mowing around the, uh, the cottage itself. There we go. Uh, what, what the proposal is before you is for a private road uh, to serve a new lot that we're looking to carve out of the parent remaining 10 and a half acre parcel, which is roughly this configuration right in here. Uh, in addition to that, we're asking for the planning board to review an extension of the sewer uh, service area. Uh, when the Holtz built this property back in 86, 87, Bill, uh, the sewer service area wasn't a mapped entity at the time. I spoke with Bob Malley regarding that. So the sewer service area stops beyond the limit of this property, but this house is served by public sewer. Uh, so what we're asking for is a review by the board per the standards of the, the town's requirements for extension of that. The board is supposed to look at it first and then recommend recommendations made to council. So we're asking to include the entire 10 acre piece plus the the lot that would be proposed to include those in the service uh, area. The access coming into the site right now is, it is a, just about a 50 foot wide right away. Uh, the bearings on both sides aren't exactly aligned, so the right away actually is a little bit wider in width as you come down to this location in here. Uh, as I indicated, we've asked for waivers for the design of the private road. 
the driveway right now to the house, to where the garage is, is 345 feet. Uh, so the overall private road extension uh, that we're looking for to this point, which is within the right of way that we're defining, is only 300 feet. It's only serving the one existing house and then one new lot. Uh, the character to put in a 22 foot wide paved area coming through here is rather excessive. Uh, the other complications we get into are there are two twin 36 inch culverts that convey the stream that continues running on through and then out to the ocean. Uh, there's storm drains, uh, catch basins and running tide. It outfalls down here as well by the 36 inch culverts. And then there's another drainage easement over here with another culvert that picks up the water and then runs it underneath the driveway and dumps it all out downstream on this side of the existing driveway. So a combination of, to widen this out to 22 feet, the excessive amount of grading required to construct this will mean impacts to the stream because the culverts will have to be expanded in length uh, in order to do the appropriate grading on either side, which is an environmental impact. There's ledge in this area. Uh, we prefer to avoid having to deal with ledge removal, especially if we already have some of the utilities coming through, primarily the water line. Uh, and that the other issues are, uh, excuse me, I'm losing my voice, let me grab a bottle of water here. I thought I was just gonna lose my voice altogether, I'm fighting off a cold. And we met with uh, Chief Gleason to discuss the narrowness of the road down to 14 feet of pavement with a two foot grass gravel shoulders on either side. Uh, the discussion in the field was if we could put a fire hydrant in here, he was somewhat receptive to being able to buy into the, the, sh the narrower roadway. Uh, fortunately, Portland Water District actually has an eight inch water main that extends to just about here. Uh, and we can provide a fire hydrant off of that. We've had initial conversations with the water district. Uh, their procedure right now, right from the get go, is it takes them 30 days to respond to you. Uh, they've already had 22, so I'm still waiting for final response back for them. We've had communications back and forth, and it doesn't seem to be an issue, but I don't have any confirmation in writing at this point to give you a definitive answer on that. Uh, but it, it's quite, a, quite apparent we'll be able to put that in. Um, so, and then with the turnaround itself, the turnaround is constructed to what the town standards are in terms of the overall width and length of the turnaround in order to accommodate for a fire apparatus or our emergency vehicle access to be able to get in and turn around and get back out. Plus they have the access to get up into the full paved plaza driveway area in front of the, uh, the Holt residence right now. There were issues that we needed, we'd asked for in terms of the roadway alignment. Uh, the requirement for the private road is that it is located within the center of the right of way. Uh, right now, the driveway itself is not located within the center. Uh, if you come in from running tide off this side of the right of way, we're 22 feet to the center line, so we're three feet short uh, of hitting on center line. And as you come down to where the road starts to turn, we're 27 feet from this property corner to the center line of the right of way, uh, to the roadway. Uh, adjustment of this left and right starts to get into issues where we start impacting the grading along this side and the existing drainage line that comes down along this side. And then we get into some ledge issues on this side that we're, we're trying to stay away from. <clears throat> and I know I'll get into Mr. Harding's letter later. He seemed to have other than not knowing exactly what that offset was, it didn't appear that it was that much of an offset, and it really isn't, and we're trying to minimize the environmental impact of constructing a roadway through that location. Uh, let's see. The lot itself, <clears throat> in terms of buildable window, this is the building window, combination between the 250 foot RP1 setback, and then the required lot setback from right away, as well as along this property line in here. So 
roughly within the building window, we're looking at just over 11,000 square feet of area in which a house could be constructed, driveway, and, uh, and improvements. The wooded area beyond this location, we cannot develop because of the restrictions within that 250-foot zone. The areas that are shown, that are currently maintained as mode, we've shown on the plan that those would be continued to be maintained as such, that no permanent structures would be allowed within that other than like a child's playground, play equipment structure that could be removed so that they could continue to have gardens or uh, that sort of nature of use in that area. Uh, this portion of the site is, is relatively high and this area drains back down towards this wetland and one of the abutters, the Bagans, had some issues and I will discuss that in just a few minutes. So that the majority of all the development sits on a higher point up in here. So the road actually, when it comes in here, and then we're looking at a driveway to come up to serve the lot here. We're probably looking at about a four foot grade change between the end of the hammerhead up to where you would come up to a relatively level area for where the house would go. Drainage for the majority of this is gonna either be draining forward towards the, the roadway or down in this direction. Uh, one of the, and I'll go to the Bagans comments, was an email, a letter that Maureen had forwarded to me that they were concerned with this area out back because it ponds. Uh, it is an RP2 wetland, which they had indicated in their letter they had seen some flagging out there, but they weren't sure if it was wetland. Uh, I know they were concerned that someone could come in and put a pool and all sorts of other uses associated with residential development. But as indicated, where we can't really do any disturbance within that zone area, there's not going to be the potential for significant impervious and further grading and drainage going down into this wetland area in here. So that the limitations for what can occur up here is going to have a limited impact to any sort of additional runoff going down in this area. It being maintained in this current condition is going to act as an infiltrator and manage any runoff that's coming down in that direction itself. Uh, they also, uh, I'll go into the easement issues uh, because there are a couple of others uh, that also had raised that as we went through it. Uh, I can get into Mr. Harding's letter because I know and part of his comment was that we didn't have a complete application and part of that is where we're asking for the waiver. Some of the things that Steve had cited in there are basically these subdivision standards for private road development, which would mean putting it as a 22 foot wide roadway, looking for center line profile and vertical uh, profile, utility locations and we've done this in the past. The feeling was that to go to that extent at this point without getting some sort of guidance from the board that it was a reasonable expectation to retain a waiver. To go ahead and do all that engineering uh, beyond what we'd submitted, which we did do the grading plan uh, to show that the, the roadway can be constructed. We did not submit it at this stage. Uh, we have gone and we've been working on making those changes to be able to submit. Uh, recognize we couldn't give them to the board before tonight uh, because it needs to go back to, to Maureen and then back to Steve to review. But we feel given the nature of this, we have completed enough information in order to be able to further discussion with the board uh, on the merits of what has been requested. Uh, the water service going into the lot we had shown on there is to be determined. Part of that again was in reference to where the driveway location would be to serve the house. The standards and cited in Mr. Harding's letter was that you can't come off the T. When we met with Chief Gleason, while well, he's not the jurisdiction, as I understand on that, it indicated he didn't have an issue with the driveway coming off the end of that. I've had subsequent comments, conversations with Bob Malley, who basically said that submit him a plan, and he didn't say absolutely no, but he would review it based on the conditions of what we're proposing. And that's where the driveway would come off. Uh, the, utilities that were referenced in Steve's letter that he couldn't really identify. Uh, when you look at it on a computer screen, you can read them fairly well, but when they were printed out and then submitted, uh, the graphics didn't really read very well. So I even had trouble looking back trying to find them on the plan. So the utilities were there with the exception of the two services for sewer and water coming to serve the new lot. Uh, but it is available for us to be able to tie into. Uh, what else? The stormwater uh, waiver for the stormwater report, that was an error on my behalf. There was an editorial cut 
on the list of waivers that we would requested. Somehow that request was deleted, but the rationale as to why we didn't need the stormwater was in the submission due to the fact that with the increase of impervious area for where the private road is coming through is only about 1,200 square feet, uh, and the improvements that are proposed as part of that grading will accommodate for treating that additional water and conveying it uh, uh, to the same locations that it's currently going to. So that was an uh, editorial slip of the finger, I guess, when I must have cut that out of the, the waiver requirements. Then I'd go to, uh, I think I'll find Steve's letter here. The other comment he made was in regards to DEP and the work within association where the stream is. I've had a conversation with DEP, and uh, I forgot the gal's last name. It's Audie, and she's the one who handles Cape Elizabeth. So we discussed the plan uh, in terms of the stream crossing, and where there's no impact to the stream with the construction of this roadway, that there is no DEP permit required. Uh, not even a PBR uh, for the activity within it because there is no disturbance. And uh, I can get her to respond via an email so that you have it for the record. But she had had the conversation and she was on the road when she gave me that information, so I was unable to get an email from her. Okay. Regarding the survey, stamp survey. Uh, that is in the works. We had, had uh, the meets and bounds done just primarily for the right of way, uh, but in conversations with Maureen, uh, understand the clarity in terms of what you're looking for, and that would be a stamp survey that includes the parent parcel, the defined uh, meets and bounds for the proposed lot, as well as the right of way. And that's currently, I was hoping to have that today, but that hasn't been completed yet. So I'm waiting on the survey to finish that up. So that information will be available in our next submission. So. I think that covers most of what's going on as far as what's being proposed. Uh, in terms of the questions and comments that have come in to Maureen from the abutters, one regarding vehicular access, and as I said, it's only to the Duffet property that they are the only ones that have access over the toad road. Uh, the toad road itself, as far as pedestrian access from those abutters who have legal rights, if you will, right now to access that, will continue to have that. That'll be conveyed as when the pro properties are sold, that will continue as an easement for those abutters across that property. Uh, there was one other email I received today, and I'm not sure exactly where the comment was coming from in terms of pedestrian easement. Uh, Ms. Pierce uh, off of Massfield wrote it was. Uh, I'm not sure she has rights over this tote road, but in looking at the town tax maps and things, I think that what she may be referring to, and I'm making an assumption, is that there's a utility, a drainage, and pedestrian easement, at least it shows on the tax maps, coming through here. And then there's a pathway that actually is on, defined on this side of the driveway right now, opposite the paved area that goes into the uh, sewer pump station that goes and provides access out to the water. I believe that is what she's talking about the only areas which would cross the right of way and that would continue to uh, continue uh, as an opportunity for them to, to use that. Uh, and again, anything on here associated with rights in terms of pedestrian easement access and our views will be conveyed with the property uh, with the sale of this piece as well as if the parent parcel which is for sale also is conveyed. Uh, I think that covers most of it. I know there was an issue discussed in regards to future use of the Duffet property, and that is, I know, there's been some emails and comments. Uh, and there was a letter from Bob Danielson, that's the other one I forgot, uh, that we received this morning. Uh, with the exception of the one comment in there where he talks about the apparent tote road alignment not matching up on our plans with what's recorded, uh, I think. Probably the issue is what he's looking at is where we have the driveway shown on this plan. The exhibit that was submitted to me that was recorded in the Register of Deeds just has the house footprint and then the easement going around this end of the house, and it pretty much aligns up with what we're showing on the plan. So there's not really any discrepancy. It still provides that means of access around the house 
to get out onto the field and over to the Deffert property. And there were a couple of other Steve's comments, which were basically really housekeeping things regarding the construction entrance, which we had shown on the plan, but uh, wasn't shown to the full length. The detail was correct, but the actual graphic on the plan wasn't correct. So we'll, we'll make those corrections for the next submission. So any questions, I'd be happy to answer those or? No, I, I'm gonna go first. Oops. Bob, in the, in the letter from uh, the law offices of Robert Danielson. Yes. And I know you talked about the the uh, Thoat Road easement, and I, it may be the same. It may be the same thing. Um, points three and four, where it talks about negative easement. I'm gonna let Bill respond to that. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure I understand fully what that is, and I know on their drawing they submitted it has some red circle and outline and. So All right, I got the didn't get the one with the red circles that didn't come through. Yeah, so. I didn't draw those. They printed that one. Yeah. So. Okay. Bill. Um, Good evening everybody. My name is Bill Dale. I'm a lawyer in Portland. I'm here on behalf of Dr. Holt. The negative easement is a reference in effect to a view easement that's given for the benefit of these properties out, out this way. And as Bob Metcalf said a minute ago, Initially, the proposal for the out parcel that we're discussing that's here was also going to be a little bit on that side of the entrance road. And as Bob said, that's changed. But I think that the negative easement is in effect a view easement, so that these, the Rich House and the Duffet's House have a view out this way to the ocean. And that's respected, and no, we don't think we're encroaching in it. We can't, and you can't let us, and we can't do it. So, um, but that's what the negative easement is. It's in fact a view easement. And it prohibits any, it prohibits any buildings, and it prohibits any vegetation. I think over five feet or something like that. Would it be possible for you to submit a copy of the easement? Oh yes, we can do that. The negative easement, yes. I think it's already, that was about the okay. thing. Yeah. I thought we'd put all that My in apologies. here. My apologies. Uh, yeah. yeah. Gee, that exciting reading I did over the weekend. Yeah. Uh, Makes me feel like, good, all this work. It's like negative reading. <laughs> negative reading. <laughs> it's, uh, I think tab five. Yeah, as you go through, you need wine when you're reading it. <laughs> oh, it does say negative beads. Yeah. in. It's, uh, there it is. Okay. Yeah, negative easement, quit claim deed with covenant. Yep. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right, Joe, you were, you were first. All right. So um, I'm referring to the email from uh, Chief Gleason on uh, February 15th, where at the end of it he said I would like to see that any access to the cottage to the right of the whole property be required to have access that would meet the private way standard so correct me if I'm wrong but doesn't that mean you have to delineate a right of way and have stand, uh, details for the construction of that private access way well what I don't have my for some reason my email from Peter is not here but it was I thought it was an access, not a private roadway. Yes. Right. So, and that was... Have access that would meet the private yeah. way standard. I thought you said private road. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to let Bill help me out on this one in terms of what those rights are. Uh, understanding that Dr. Holtz and has the first right of refusal for that parcel, but does not own it. And that that first right of refusal will go to whoever acquires the larger parcel. Uh, so that will continue on, but he has no control over what happens with that particular parcel in itself. It's only accessible is is over that field right now. And I must have gone to sleep. What have I got to do here? More. And that that tote road access for that property 
dates back to 1940 something, doesn't it? Yeah. Something like that? That is 29, isn't it? 27. Oh, wow. Okay. Further than I thought. It's old. Anyway, yes. it's been there for a long time. But the tow road access is immaterial. Because what Chief Gleason's talking about is a access for either fire or medical to get in there. And it would be using the new the road that they're creating now. Okay. Not the tow road. Okay. So that requirement, as I understand this, and I could be wrong, is that the right-of-way extends from what you're showing as the end of your what you're doing onto the whole property. The right-of-way, I mean, the, the right-of-way that we're talking about comes over what is the existing driveway area yeah. to serve this. It's providing frontage to this lot. This lot is landlocked and its only access is over the field. Right, but right. what I'm saying is that my understanding is that what Chief Gleason wants is this thing constructed or at least delineated as according to the private access way standard. And that's understood, but he has no control over what happens on this particular property. And right, it's out. He does have control over what happens on his property. What, where does his, where's his boundary? Who's Who's boundary? Is that, is that Dr. Holt's property? Dr. Holt's boundary is. This is Dr. Holt's property right here. Yeah. So yes. He has control over up to. Correct. He could go behind too. So the, the right of way that the Duffets have goes over that property. And I know you're talking I, about delineation. Seen, we've not seen any plan with a right of way depicted on it. And I think Chief Gleason's asking more for more than this. Stuff. Yeah, and I, he is. I think he is too. And personally, I question whether we should require somebody to build a private access way to property they, they don't own. If I might, Madam Chairman, I believe this is Dr. Holt's existing house, and the Duffet lot is here, and there is an easement in front of Dr. Holt's house to come to the Duffet house. And what we've been talking about is whether to accommodate the fire chief, we want to put a paved road out here in Dr. Holt's front yard, and you can imagine that Dr. Holt doesn't want to do that. <laughs> well, that's another way to put it, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, but you can imagine, I mean, this is a very valuable, uh, fancy house and a valuable lot, and you're not going to, a prospective owner is not going to want to have a paved driveway to this house. There is, in fact, and your point is well taken, there is an easement as a matter of law across the front yard to get to the Duffet's house, and we can show that on a plan, so there's no question about that. That's a far cry, and that's what exists today. That's not anything new. That's a far cry, though, from putting in a paved driveway across here, which you can imagine would have a very deleterious effect on the attractiveness of the property for a prospective purchase. Could I respond to that? Is about right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Maureen would like to respond. Mr. Dale, with respect. I don't think that the access that the fire chief is suggesting has to follow the exact alignment of the existing rights of the Duffets. There could be something laid out that goes behind. On the back the side of the house. On the back side, and it could be something that the owner of what we'll call the Holt lot retains control over. But if at any point the owner of the Holt lot and the owner of the Duffet lot become the same person, you know, the expectation is that the, the Duffet Cottage is in a, a spectacular location. And then at some point, somebody's going to put a lot of money into that location. Understood. And when they come in and get the building permit, there is nothing in the current ordinance that will allow the town to require better access to that house than the current tote road which the fire chief has explained, is totally unable to support his emergency equipment. So the thought was that if at some point when the Holt lot and the Duffet lot are owned by the same person and significant investment goes into the Duffet cottage, there be created a right to get from the end of the right of way the end of the private road, From place around the back, yeah. over to the Duffet Cottage for emergency vehicles. 
Dr. Holt's here and he can, he's heard your comments. I just wanted can, to make sure that that was no. made clear that that's, that was the thing that was coming out. It's understood and that's something that he can think about. Just understand going on the water side is just is a sort of non-starter. On oh, the back side absolutely. is something that could be thought about. Please understand also that Dr. Holt's house is here, has a right of first refusal and he would like to buy that, but for the moment that hasn't happened. And if those two got joined, it's entirely possible that the modest Duffet cottage could be torn down and just become part of the lawn. That remains to be seen. What a purchaser of, of Dr. Holt's existing house might do with this lot. Might improve it and might just tear down the house and have it be lawn. All right, we'll do just a couple, couple more comments and then we're going to... Can I, can I, can I just ask, Lou, boy, almost pointed a laser at you. Uh, could I ask Maureen a question, a clarification of what she just said? That what your reference was that if Dr. Holt or the buyer, purchaser of this lot acquired Duffet lot, then that would be required. If no conveyance to Mr. Holt or to the purchaser of this lot acquires this, then that obligation would not be required? Yes, and further, I'd suggest that there would have to be some kind of trigger of a building permit of a significant amount, so that even if you were the owner of the Duffet lot and the Holt lot, and you were just keeping it the way it is, you're not increasing the use of it, therefore not create, increasing the risk that the town already has. Right. But if you were going to be replacing that cottage with a substantial investment, that that would be the time that there should also be a rational way to get to the place. Okay, so to further clarify, Bill owns this lot. I decide to buy this. Does that mean I've got to do the private access? Well, if... if I'm, I'm just trying to be clear yeah, so and, fully and, understand. And I don't think there's a fixed way to get this going, but uh, what we've heard from Dr. Holt is that he has right of first refusal, Correct. one, and two, that he intends to convey that right of first refusal to whoever buys the estate lot. Right, and, so, and that, that part so is clear. So let's say you're the person that buys the estate lot. You also are the beneficiary of the right of first refusal, and the Duffets decide that they want to sell and you exercise your right and you now own that lot. Nothing happens. Now you decide that would be a lovely short-term rental with a three-bedroom, 360-degree view, and you decide to replace that cottage. That's when the trigger should happen to create reasonable access for emergency vehicles. Let me ask it another way. Bill holds the lot again. Duffets don't sell to Bill, or Bill doesn't exercise that option, but I buy that lot. And I never will. Don't worry about that. <laughs> <coughs> Blow my pay rate, sorry. <laughs> uh, what happens if I were the one who buy that and I'm going to improve the house? What does that do in terms of a buyer of that lot? I think this lot? only works if the same entity owns both lots I just at the want, same time. All right. That's what I just want to be clear on. So. And, okay. Okay, well, I'm going to take just a couple more and then we're going to give the public a chance to talk. So, go ahead, Jonathan. Um, one, I don't think we need to talk about the cottage anymore. I don't <laughs> think that's part of the application. But um, can you just explain a little bit too much? We, we did receive a letter that you referred to from the Bagan family. Yes. Um, about the, the wetlands behind their house. Right. Uh, you said that you think that everything's going to drain sort of not towards that rp1 and go different directions is that based on the topography what, what are you basing that on it's on the topography right. this, this this is the higher point we don't have a footprint for a house and haven't designed anything but this is a higher point of the site itself and then everything slopes this way and this way this is all remaining undisturbed we can't the buyer of this lot cannot do anything within that 250 foot zone so that any and, and again, I said the total f area of the footprint for the house is a little over 11,000 square feet. So that is in most likelihood, that's not gonna be 100% impervious stream building, driveway, paved surfaces. And there will probably be lawn. The wooded buffer that's retained in here will be enough to infiltrate and detain any increased amount of water. If, in their reference, if a pool or something else or a tennis court or what have you, and I can't remember exactly all the, the, the comments they made, could occur out here, yes, that would probably be uh, of concern that there would be additional impervious cover. But there will not be any 
other disturbance in impervious area other than what can be contained within the footprint of where the house could go. Okay, so you're saying that under your application that there's no sort of pool or anything that could have any sort of impervious surface that could be created in that buffer area? Nothing. Thanks. And then even in within this zone here, as I stated, it can be maintained as mowed as it is right now. They could have gardens, they could have place, you know, kids play structures that are only temporary, but they couldn't do any pavement or anything within this within the confines of what is currently mowed. Thank okay. You. Okay. You, you all set? You sure? I was going to give you a chance to talk. <laughs> all right. Um, I'm going to open it for public hearing on completeness. Do we have the, all the information we need in order to make a decision on whether this applicant should go forward? Um, so, uh, again, please try to limit yourself to three minutes. Give your name and your address. And uh, would anyone like to speak? Thomas McNabo, I represent uh, Robert Flaherty, who's one of the abutters, who's the major abutter uh, behind the proposed lot. Um, and uh, as Mr. Metcalf mentioned, I'm, I, I would be very interested in seeing a more detailed survey of the uh, meets and bounds here, uh, surround, uh, particularly with, with, with respect to the uh, proposed private road. Uh, it's hard to pick off of the plan I had. I, I think they're there, but they're hard to pick off. I want to uh, point out something, probably without uh, necessity, because I'm, I would assume most of you are aware of it, but the originally uh, the right of way which runs between the circle at the end of uh, running tide road up to the Holt property <clears throat> was a part of a uh, plan which is part of the uh, city's uh, uh, town's plan uh, which was filed in 1970 called Jordan Lot Development Plan and in that plan that that particular uh, easement is described uh, in particularity as a uh, connecting street. And <clears throat> I've tried over the past couple of weeks to try to determine what a connecting street means, which I haven't been able to find uh, exactly what it means, but it is a, uh, a street is a road uh, within the meaning of your ordinance. And therefore, once that Paper Street was turned into a road, uh, it became either a private access way or a private road. Uh, it's not a driveway, in my opinion. Uh, it's probably not a private road because uh, I don't believe you could have a private road with, that, uh, with, the, with the previous frontage. In other words, the frontage to the Holt property off of that plan is only 50 feet. Uh, so it, it was probably a private access way. And whether or not that makes any difference in this application, I'm not sure, uh, I, I admit. But I, I raise that because uh, uh, it, it, it could be important, and it hasn't been mentioned in either the application uh, or any of the discussions that I've been aware of. And uh, I think that is something that should be looked into. Uh, because after all, it seems to me the private road creation is, is probably running only from the uh, boundary line of the Holt land. Uh, there was a deed from Balfour uh, okay. to Holt in 19... You, you need to wrap up, you need to wrap up, if you would please. Okay, so I just raised that. The other thing is I, I think uh, it would be appreciated if there was uh, going forward possibly a site uh, walk on this site. Oh, uh, yeah. And happen. I'm interested in the buffers 
uh, which are described in one of the plans which have been submitted. So thank you very much. I think you can be assured there will be a sidewalk on this property. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak? Uh, my name's Nancy Bagan. Uh, my husband and I submitted, oh, sorry, seven running tide. My husband and I submitted a letter to you, complete with pictures. I hope you got them. I had some trouble sending them. Um, my major concern here is while I appreciate Dr. Holtz wanting to sell a big piece of property, up until this point, I haven't seen any consideration for what the land, what the, what the problem could how it could impact the neighbors. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. There are two issues that I think are important here. This is the first time seeing the wetlands even delineated on that back piece. That must be a newer a map than, than I saw in my backyard. Um, while nothing can be built or changed within the building lot, as I understand it, because of the wetlands, is there any kind of guarantee to those of us who live around there that while nothing is, bought, nothing is built or changed, well, suddenly my backyard fills up with water, and oh, gee, I don't know how that happened. We didn't do anything. Are there any guarantees that I'm not left then trying to put another drain in, put more buffers in, put a sump pump in? I mean, is, is anybody accountable for when that does happen? Because I truly think it will happen. We are in a valley. If you go out and walk around, it's quite obvious. And there's, and there's water there all year round. And by sending you this letter, I've, I've kind of tipped my hand. Should I ever want to sell it down the road? I am saying, yes, there is a water issue there. But we've tried to maintain the best we could by keeping a buffer, keeping, keeping um, natural buffer. We even went as far as the letter said to uh, plant weeping willow trees to try to soak up the water. But... It doesn't really work. So my concern is, while the building is on the far end of the lot, it is up higher. It is a grading issue, much like the other project you were looking at. And what's to say that that grading, and, and which is a higher level, is not just going to run down lower? Water seeks, obviously, goes down to the bottom. My other thought is the building lot extends out into the big field behind the house and our right of way to the beach is is that tote road and tonight I hear that the people who own that property could put up movable structures like playgrounds and stuff like that which is fine but if I want to go to the beach from my house via the tote road. I then walk through this person's backyard, through their jungle gyms or their playgrounds for their children, back out onto the Holt property, we'll call it, and then back down again. I, I foresee real neighborly issues uh, going down the road. I, I don't know that I'd really want people traipsing through my backyard like that, even though it is a deeded right of way. Um, thanks. Thank you. Hi, I'm Trish Wasserman from Three Running Tide Road, and I just had a couple of questions um, to clarify. Will there be some revised maps soon that show the current distribution of lots, say, along Running Tide Road in Macefield? You know, we, there have been some transactions, and it's hard to find a public map that actually shows what lots there are in in this part of the neighborhood. I, I don't. I'm not aware of any lot line changes. Well, like our, like we bought, we just bought property, so okay. we, it's hard to find a map that shows right. where so our property your, ends your and your property is builds, yeah. way down the road. It, it's right, right at that line. Yeah. Right. So, so I'm just what asking. Would, what would need to happen is for the planning board to tell the applicant that they want them to show more area than they're currently showing. So what I'm what I'm getting at is, um, in this area, on run, the lower Running Tide Road. It appears that there are some new lots 
Um, I think another new lot was just carved out or maybe re-separated no. from a property. Do you want me to answer? Yeah. Uh, right so, there's, so there's there's no new lots. So because it's an existing subdivision and no one could create a new lot without getting to the planning board. So it's people who own double lots that are then breaking them back out. But that would, I mean, if you want a plan that shows that, you'd have to talk to the assessing office because they show lot lines based on ownership and they don't show double or triple lots. So and, the, and the reason I'm asking that is just to say, how many more lots could be rebroken or broken up again according to be able to still be within code? How many more buildings or homes can actually be built from um, running tide road down and still be, be within compliance on the whole property no on, it, it would include a new lot carved out there plus if we're breaking up other lots we're just trying to figure out like how many more so, houses so could go in and, and the answer to that is that they're not breaking them out brand new yeah, these yeah. were lots that were originally proved in the original subdivision and they're now choosing to build on them they're not triggering subdivision review all they're triggering is the need for a building permit. Yeah, and I'm not asking about sub I'm just saying we just are trying to figure out how many lots there actually are, how many more houses can actually and go in. Anyone who wanted to go to the registry and get a copy of the subdivision plan that was recorded and then Yeah, I was trying up. to do it and, and I did come to the office and they weren't able to produce it at the time. Right. So I'm just trying to that's figure not, out where it is. That's not the kind of thing we really keep track yeah. of. You know, we 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 plot the lots and there was a decision made that when multiple lots are owned by the same person we only show it as one lot on the assessing map but it's the lot that's on the subdivision plan that has the legal rights and in order to figure out the answer to your question you would have to go to the registry of deeds and get a copy of the original subdivision plan and then you could compare it to the assessing maps and to the neighborhood and to the homes that are already there. So it's not something that normally is done inside town hall. Mrs. Wasserman, you can go online. The plans can refer to the registry okay. are online. Yeah, I was trying to parse that. It was just hard. As a normal citizen, it's hard to know. And we're just trying to figure out only in that, in addition, if you have a big lot, and, and you have a private road coming in, how many more potential houses could go in there before it triggered a subdivision review? The subdivision was approved many, many years ago yep. with all of those lots in it. So those lots have already been approved. In addition to this one that's now being broken up no, again? No, they were approved in 1970s yes. and 70s. So this is an example of an, it's an additional lot that's that will not be reflected in that original plan that's being added in. No, the only new lot is the lot that Dr. Right. Holt is proposing. So, right, so, and He's it's... He's trying to show it on his plan. Dr. Holt wasn't part of the J lot. So no, no, but, the, the but there's J the lots? only new lot right. is the lot that Dr. Holt is proposing. Right. All the, the, the other lots already exist. Mm -hmm. They're shown on the original subdivision plan. The right. J lots. Right, I, I live in a jail. So how many, uh, so Maureen, it's just something you know, like how many houses can go in? We don't have that answer for yeah. you. Yeah, so, okay, so could I get it at some point? You can get it from yeah. the Registry of Deeds. Which they is have, and it's online. online. So. Yeah, I did try to look. Okay, so no one else can, so no one can help me work through that paperwork at Town Hall. It's, it's is basically it. It's okay. page six. Okay. There you go. There you go. Mainland you got records. the answer. Yeah. WWW Mainland Records. Okay. But I also think the question might be, whether how many lots could come off of Dr. Holt's property exactly. right now. It, and and without, without triggering, without triggering a subdivision plan. I'm sorry, you're saying it much better than I, I I think I'm closer to it. That's uh, is this it? Is this it? Like, this is it. No more lots can be carved off of that and well, access from that private road without you, triggering subdivision. I can tell you that based on that 250-foot yeah. buffer from an RP1 wetland, nothing can happen within that buffer. And I believe yeah. Yeah. your lot is in that buffer, isn't it? My lot, so we it? do. Are you further down? We're further down, but so if the Duffet lot, and this, this is all being passed forward, this if is the, where, This is where your property it's lot It's right there, yeah. So if the Duffet lot gets merged, that could be, is that, like, is that the additional lot that could be carved out to be accessed by the private road? It's not, a, I'm sorry, Ms. Larson, it's not a new lot. 
it, it exists now. Yes, yeah, so it would be considered a lot that would then have its frontage on the new private road. It has road. no frontage now, no. and it's right. a non-conforming lot right. exists now with no road frontage at all. Nothing is proposed mm -hmm. for it. Okay. I think you got what I was trying to ask, though. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? I'm going to ask you, please, you know, it's 10 past 9. Can we move, move along? <laughs> it's been a long day. Is, is there anyone else who wants to speak after this gentleman? I'm going to ask you to please make yourself readily available to jump in. Uh, my name is Doug Bagan. Uh, I'm Nancy's husband. Um, I would, did not see the um, complete application, unfortunately. But um, what, as far as the buffer, what type of um, uh, agreement or um, restrictions would be put on that building lot in terms of um, the next owner? Okay, on, on the new lot or the old lot? Or the, the, the new building lot uh, that is being proposed. Restrictions. And also, as far as the uh, the gray area there, which I understand to be the uh, where the building site could be or would be, uh, if that's at a higher uh, elevation, it would seem to me that the water is going to be going down toward our home and toward that wetlands that um, is indicated on the on the map so again what um, what limitations on that property would there be to at least uh, put some type of buffer to uh, direct the water uh, not back into the valley which goes at our home so I think it's just a question in terms of what what would be uh, what type of restrictions would there be on that on that property, if any. Is that it? Yeah. How would I find that out too? Well, it's all part of the discussion that goes on as this process goes through. So. Okay. We don't have the answers. All the answers. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? You good? All right, close the public hearing. Any other questions from the board? Victoria. Okay, um, we are talking about completeness and I gotta tell the applicant, I'm very concerned um, when our town engineer says something is incomplete. I did hear you say you're working on these. Uh, some of them are just uh, have to do with the road, but when I hear from our engineer that things are incomplete, that gives me concern. Um, I'm also hearing from the town planner that um, the, what really got me is this is not a survey because a, a surveyor has not. A, sur a surveyor has, it just hasn't been stamped, okay? Makes In the me a little nervous I know. That and it's the, not the boundaries, the boundary, if I may, the boundary survey that defines the whole property is the survey that was based on the SMRT survey, which is the plan you folks all looked at during the previous discussions on what the transfer of the Wasserman property and the, tr the piece that Mr. Holt retained down onto Hannaford. So that the lot line that's shown here, which is the one that created the conveyance to Mrs. Wasserman and her husband, is here. So this closure, I gotta lose myself here, this closure, which is the whole property, all the way through, with the exception of the description here, is the same description as you've looked at before. It isn't any different. The description for the lot itself that's being carved out, which the lot is not necessarily what you're looking at per se, as far as the lot, it's the ability to provide access to the lot. That description of the right-of-way has been done 
but we had it done by the surveyor who did the topographic work for us, and they would not stamp the plan. So the plan that was done by North, I want to say Northeast Civil, it's not Northeast Civil, North um, Civil, bleh. Longview. No, Northeast Civil Solutions. Uh, they are the ones that will be putting the stamp on the plan. They had promised to have that to me at the end of last week, and there was a glitch on their behalf, and we're working through that, and I hope to have that today. There is a certified survey. I just don't have the stamp one with me. Okay. okay. So. Um, I also like to say, um, as far as incomplete, um, Al Frick um, was out on the property. He did a report. Correct. And he did notice about the stream. And I would like you to please add to um, your plans where that 75-foot setback goes. Because in his very small, very hard to read, the 75-foot setback looks like it almost goes into the building envelope. So I want that clarified. Sure. Now, um, oh, so I, I am a little confused. There's an easement note. It says easement area. And I'm not sure if this is what you said you took off. But where it says easement area, I, I'm just not clear what the... Are you talking the four? I, I'm not sure if this is before, after. You is, talking this area here? That, is that easement area gone? No. When you saw this at sketch plan, a workshop session, the new lot was this portion over here on this side of the right of way yep, and, and included that land area. Right. And because of the questions about whether or not that could be considered a buildable lot, which it isn't, we turned and made this as a conveyance, as an easement, as a view easement and access that would go with the out sale of this parcel. So this land area remains with the parent parcel. So it's a view easement, so you are, because view. it just says easement area, and I couldn't find anything to describe what it is. I'm hearing view easement, so I'm, I'm assuming you're going to clear all the trees. No. No? no. Okay, it's then I'm going to need more detail. We don't have we, to get into it. We can do that. Completeness. And my next question is, um, as far as the negative easement goes, I would like when um, this, you go back to this, um, we did get that letter saying um, that they did not believe that the view easement on this plan was the same view easement that was in um, the book and page that I don't have off the top of my head. So I, uh, actually, 8583, page 163. If I could, if you could please add surveyor notes to show that this is the exact same easement, sure. that would just ease my mind. And then my next question is, in Al Frick's report, there is a question about the existence of a vernal pool. Mr. Frick indicates that an evaluation should be done prior to April 7th to confirm its existence. Mr. Frick also noted that a vernal pool evaluation may not be necessary if the proposed development meets certain DEP rules. Specifically, if a vernal pool does exist, the developer may still develop 25% of the land that is within 250 feet of the potential vernal pool. So, I would ask that you please have a soil scientist evaluate the area noted by Al Frick as a potential vernal pool prior to April 7th. If this is a vernal pool, please indicate what percentage of the land would be developed within the 700, excuse me, within the 250 foot of the potential vernal pool. And I think that's part of the survey work that was done by Al when he looked at the entire parcel. Yes, it and, is. And I believe, and I'll, have, I'll verify for you, the reference to the vernal pool, I believe, was on the other end of the property. But I will get that confirmed it's, for you. It's between the Bagans and proposed lot number two. Are we talking the same spot? Yeah, this should be a follow-up letter that was in there that Chris Copey did for... Uh, I did not get that. Did the it should be part of the that? packet. I'm sorry, I did not get that letter. You said part of the package? It should be part of the submission with Al Frick's information. Okay, part of this. So, what Wetland, uh, nine. Okay. Reference. If you could direct me to it, I would appreciate it. It's on tab nine. Yep, tab nine. In the first letter, it's addressed to me. And then there's a second. Natural resource summary, proposed lot two. Is it in the second letter? 
This is from, uh, no, it can't be the second letter. That's December of 2014. No, no, no. The first letter. So it's in the first letter. Yes. The one is dated January 26, 2017. Yes. So we're talking about that vernal pool, which I see on page two. Yeah. All right, I'll clarify that for you. Okay, um, okay. you have a date there before uh, April 7th. I would ask that you please meet that date. If it's not a vernal pool, it needs to be determined, because it, if it is a vernal pool, you can still, within the 250 feet, which it seems you probably will be within 250 feet, you can develop 25% of the land. Right. So I would need you to confirm that this 11,000 square feet or so is 25% of the land. That's sure. the kind of detail I'll be looking for for completeness. That's not a problem. And on April 7th, while it's in his letter, part of that also is subject to snow cover. So oh, if yeah, it's- I understand that, okay. but by April 7th, I'm hoping- So am I. Yeah. Well, I was in Boston on Saturday, it was 72 degrees, so I was really hoping. So I'm, I'm hoping, but it is a hard and fast date, and yep. I'm bringing it up so that I'm asking you to please get a, well, get the, a soil sign. The science. time frame for evaluating a vernal pool is usually beginning of April through the end of May. It's a time frame period in which they do the evaluation, so it isn't like it has to be done by April 7th. Okay. It's a window of opportunity to do that evaluation. It can start earlier if the snow is all gone and things are blooming, uh, but that's partly basically all our site evaluators. They follow the way the weather goes, the snow melts and everything okay. in terms of activity. So I'm just going by, should be evaluated in the early spring prior to April 7th. Okay. okay. And my last one is Alfred also noted that an expansion of the existing access within the right of way will require a section two and 10 permit by rule from the DEP because it requires fill in a stream and soil disturbance within 75 feet of the stream. And, so are those, were those and, permits and in No, the and that was based on developing a full 22 foot wide roadway. Therefore, the reason was we came in to request the waiver mm -hmm. to go with the 14 foot with the two foot gravel shoulders, therefore we do not impact the resource. And I had the conversation, as I said in my presentation with DEP, and explained that, and I don't okay. even need a PBR. That's okay. what you're addressing. Great. So okay. I will be looking for that letter. Okay. And there was something about floodplains in our package of material. And let's see, floodplains was on. Coastal flood. Seven. Just yes, the coastal flood. Um, I have a hard time. I see a map. Um, a table I can't read, another map, and another map. It really means nothing so, to me, but we do. So we, we would ask them to put it on the plan, show the flood. I, I mean, the yeah, more okay. because we do have something called RP3. RP3 is part of the uh, floodplains. And so I, I need more detail. Sure. And for, your, for your information, the first two graphics you're looking at are soils. Okay. okay. They're in the floodplains. <laughs> All right. So okay. I would appreciate having, because yep. we do have the RP3, and yep. I you can do that. have no idea if what you're covering for flood, so it seems incomplete. So those are my just incomplete questions I have. So thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Peter. Yeah, one thing I'm not seeing that I would like to, I'm not sure we have the right to require it, or I mean, unless you can advise us. This whole exercise is aimed at creating this uh, a new lot to build on. And I see and there's been issues raised about drainage and so forth. I don't see, there's no topographical information about that lot itself. The, the, the topo, the information you have is really just. The, the, topo, the topo is on that, and again, it's the line weight. We, we have the, bound, the topo survey of the roadway in utilizing the town's GIS LIDAR topo. The topo is on that lot, and I apologize that the way your prints came out it doesn't read as clear, but the topo is on that on that lot. It just didn't print. It doesn't read through, but it is on the plan. If you look at plan sheets, I can't even see what that one is. It's on L1. It should be on L1, and it's also on L2. It's just that the graphics. It's just very light. The line weight is so light on there; it doesn't read through. 
there's so much information going on in these plans. It's just that they, as I said, when you look at them on the screen, they read, and then they were sent to the printers to be delivered, and they didn't read that clearly. Well, one of the things that you know I want to focus on is some of the points raised about grading on the park yep. itself. Understood. Uh, and my, I, I can't do it from what we got. Yeah, Peter, they can't hear you in the oh. back. <laughs> We need the topographical information on the parcel itself, and I, I see what you mean. It's it is there, but the graphic is not bold enough to yeah, I mean, on I the prints. And I apologize for that. On the topographical features yeah. of the parcel, yeah. other than what you know, your yeah. observations. In regards to the Wassermans, you know, is a condition. You know, we don't know what's going to be built on that lot in terms of a house, so it's tough to do. We can't do a grading plan. But I can't do as a condition that when whoever buys that lot and builds a house is a condition that uh, when they submit a building plan to for a building permit that a grading plan be provided to show that they, the grades and the runoff are not going to adversely impact towards the Wasserman's property. Bagan property. Bagan. Bagan, excuse me. <laughs> Pardon. Too many names tonight. Yeah, the way, uh, my opinion right now, the application is incomplete for two reasons. One, as a minor point, there's no water and sewer line. Proposed water and sewer line shown, that's easily fixed. Uh, the second one is more serious, in my opinion, um, that the access to the Duffet lot uh, needs to be decided upon and, uh, before we get into this too deep. And the way I read the negative easement, you can't go across the negative easement. So unless somebody can prove that negative easement, you can put a road through there if you catch 22. <clears throat> but that's my opinion. Well, not to be adversarial, but that access to the Duffet lot is not part of your submission requirements. It is a comment that came from the fire chief as a review comment to us. So it was after the submission of the documentation. So I wouldn't consider that as an incomplete item. Any other comments, questions, concerns? Um, yeah, so I would actually agree with you on your comment about the access, but I will say that at the end of this, I do want to see a note from the fire chief that he's okay with the access to the cottage that you're proposing, whatever form it may take. Okay. Anything else? Well, I, I guess. Sorry. I, I guess the access, but the access might be available, but it's not necessarily that it would be smooth enough to be able to drive a vehicle down. It could, it could have you know boulders in the way, but it would still be accessible if you see what I mean. A right of way to go there, but it wouldn't be capable of doing it. Right. The Duffets can drive across that land area right now, and again, it's only seasonal, so it is not an improvement. Somebody else would to own it and put boulders in the way. I mean, it, it wouldn't restrict the access, but at the same time, <clears throat> you might not be able to drive a vehicle across it. Well, the way the easement is written is that they have the vehicular access to get to that property, and they're the only ones that have that right. They specifically vehicular? Correct. Okay. Victoria. <coughs> Question for Maureen. Um, I'm not sure if this is um, completion or, or going further, but as far as constructing a road over the Portland Water District's land, I'm wondering if the applicant needs approval. Because um, according to their February 1988 agreement shown in our package in Section 5 between the Holtz and the Portland Water District, it says the district hereby consents constructing and perpetually maintain a driveway, and the district will construct a 10-foot wide, wide paved driveway across the intersecting area, and any additional construction shall be the sole responsibility of the Holtz. And the Holtz agree that before installing or maintaining any driveway across their intersecting area, they shall submit plans for such work to the chief engineering of the district for approval. That's on the deed. But I'm not sure if that's part of the completion that they need to come back with something from Portland Water. Is or that not. what you're waiting for? From Victoria, we submitted 
<coughs> well, okay. We submitted a plan to the water district and we've had the conversation, so I'm just waiting back from them for their final feedback. Okay, so okay. on this. Thank okay. you. Peter, you have something? Uh, no, that's right. I feel like the teacher. <laughs> <laughs> you just need a yardstick. Uh, <laughs> no, ch no chewing gum either. Uh, is it okay? I had a, a couple of quickie questions. Right. Two, Maureen, because I'm surprised these didn't come up in the, um, when the public was speaking. Um, but we saw them in the letters, like, why does this n proposal not trigger dead-end standards? Why is this proposal not considered part of a subdivision of Dr. Holt's land? Does the public have the right to walk down the 50-foot right-of-way? And why is this a private road and not just a driveway? So did you get all four of those? Yep, yep. So um, the, the applicant, Dr. Holt, met with the code enforcement officer, um, Ben McDougall and I, a few times. And we have worked through these issues. And the reality is that Dr. Holt originally owned a very long strip of land that was situated between Running Tide Road and Hannaford Cove Road. And then he came in and um, merged a lot that already was on Hannaford Cove Road. And at that time, there was a lot of discussion. I looked Dr. Holt in the eye and I said, do you want to preserve your access? Because this could be a big deal if you want to do any more development. And he said, no, I, I don't. And he sold a chunk of land right in the middle of his big long strip to the Wassermans. And at that point, his ability to create a second way into his property that's on the water is gone. So why does that matter? Well, it matters because in the subdivision ordinance, it's, there is something called the dead end road standard. And it says that if you create a subdivision, you cannot have more than 20 homes on a dead end road. And you can't have a dead end road be longer than 2,000 feet. And anyone who's measured it knows that Running Tide Road is already a dead-end road that does not meet that standard. So the conclusion was that Dr. Holt could not add any more lots to the end of Running Tide Road because of that dead-end road standard, because we assumed he would trigger subdivision review. However, when he originally got his approval for his Hannaford Cove lot, he conveyed land to an abutter himself. And under the state subdivision law, which we have to comply with, conveyance of property to a butter is an exemption under the subdivision law. Now, when he conveyed the land to the Wassermans, again, he was conveying land to an abutter. So both the lot that he created in the back is exempt, and then the Wasserman lot is exempt. So he's back down to one lot. And under subdivision law, you have to create three or more lots in a five-year period. And that's what made it possible for him to create this one more lot at the very end of Running Tide Road. So he has enough land area, but he doesn't have any road frontage to make the lot buildable. And that's why he's coming forward and taking his little private driveway and upgrading it to a private road. Because if you have frontage on a private road, you can count that frontage towards your frontage requirement to make a buildable lot. And in the RA district where this land is, you need 80,000 square feet and you need 125 feet on a town accepted road or on a private road that's been approved by the planning board or on a private access way. And he has to go with a private road because his driveway, once he creates the new lot, would provide access both to his home and to the new lot. And a private access way can only provide access to one lot. So that's why. We're not looking at subdivision review because he's only got the one lot. We can't apply the dead end road standard because he never triggered subdivision review. And all we're looking at is the private road review. Did I catch all of it? No, you missed one. The right of way. Can <laughs> people walk right down right the right of way? The, the 50 foot right of way, why are we looking at that? Um, there, somebody wrote a, a letter about um, being able to access Secret Beach, and I know this oh, is way yes. beyond, but so the, I'm the, talking about yes. the road, not so Secret Beach. The, the answer to that is that we, nothing about this project 
is changing any of the rights people already have. So if you already have rights to get to Secret Beach, this doesn't change it. And if you don't have rights to get to Secret Beach, this doesn't change it. So it is neutral regarding all those existing litigated rights. I appreciate that. I'm surprised nobody asked those questions. But they were in some of the letters. So okay. Thank you. Jonathan. So one thing off of what you're saying is that essentially Dr. Holt, the lot that he has, and if he gets this lot to um, create off the larger lot, that's it. Well, I don't want to say that. Because remember, it's three or more lots in a five-year period. So there's nothing that's, he still has more land there. We're in a zone where the minimum lot size is two acres. That doesn't mean that someone five years from now might want to clip off another lot. But with, well, with regards to, but that doesn't take into account the, the wetland and. It the, doesn't, it doesn't. I just, so. I just get nervous okay. saying okay. And never. the easements that are on it. Right, yeah. right. And, and just with regards to the easements, there was a concern that um, somebody having access on those easements. It's my understanding with easements, and this one goes to property law, is that you can't really build anything permanent on those easements that's gonna affect somebody not being able to use okay. those easements. So I don't think anybody can, needs to be concerned about somebody on that building something permanent that's going to basically block their use of that easement. So. Right, the, the only thing the board may wanna think about is, you know, we know how people tend to behave and if we know that people have rights on that easement and it w if we can avoid a situation where people will inevitably start to conflict with each other, then we should try to. Does someone want to make a motion on completeness? Now, maybe I should ask whether which way people are leaning on whether this package is complete or not. I was gonna make a motion that this is incomplete. Can I go ahead and read it? Or should, do you wanna take the poll before I read the motion? <laughs> Why don't we take the poll before you read the motion? Okay. Feelings on completeness. Do you feel this package is complete? No. Okay. Neutral. Neutral? Neutral? I'm no. torn, but I'm kinda of leaning towards no. What do you guys yeah. say? Because we got two over there. I'm saying no. I think it's actually complete. I, the, the concerns that were brought forward, I think, are legit. But um, I think it's stuff that they're going to get to us. Uh, I'm not too concerned with regards to the idea of creating a private um, access road. But. but I think Victoria's concern is a lot of the material. And I know it's not necessarily the fault of Bob's fault. It, it's being wait yeah. they're waiting for it. And there's some some map issues that, yeah. or plan issues. That, so I always I always look at this as if we never got it, because we said it was complete. Yeah. And there's some, you know, issues around the seventy five foot setback, it doesn't go into the building. I'm, I mean I have legitimate I'm not trying concerns. to argue. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm looking I at Joe. I agree with Jonathan. I think that you really do have enough information to move forward and fix the information as we go. Uh, question, if, if we don't deem it complete, do we have to wait to do a site walk? Well, we, we can do completeness and merits in the same evening. So we, right. uh, it doesn't necessarily lose a lot of time. No, if we don't... Maureen just suggested if we don't deem it complete, we probably don't want to do a site walk yet. Because I'll have questions like, so can you show me that 75 foot setback from that stream? Well, let's take it. Well, you, you indicated you did not believe it was complete. Right, but I, but I think they could, we could do completeness and the merits in one evening. I, I disagree on the site walk. I think we could do the site walk. I, I, know now. I hesitate to think that we could do that in one evening. So, with the number of questions that have come up here tonight. Well, to me, the, the questions are not big. There's just so many of them. It's the aggregation of small issues, not some big, massive Thing we haven't gotten. I, I'm disappointed that we don't have topos on the that I can read on the on the new parcel. I'm glad you specified that you can read. <laughs> so, 
Right. Let's make a motion. I'm going to make the motion that I. So here we go, guys. Motion for the board to consider be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Dr. William Holt to upgrade an existing driveway to provide frontage for a proposal proposed lot located on 15 Running Tide Road be deemed incomplete with a waiver granted from providing the following information, aesthetic, cultural, and natural information, groundwater information, and stormwater management plan. Um, I'm not going to give the waiver on the stormwater management plan. I think actually uh, that's water runoff is something very important. So I would amend this to say aesthetic, cultural, natural, and groundwater information. But I would deem it incomplete. Second. Uh, now the for question: the stormwater, are you, the stormwater waiver. Um, are you holding judgment on that until you have more information, or are you thinking of that? Uh, well, it says waiving with a waiver granted from providing, so they'll never be required to provide it. Does that even make sense to grant a waiver for something you're it's saying? Deemed as incomplete. Any waivers at all? Yeah, I can just, I mean, this was uh, for the board to consider, and I can certainly, if I find it incomplete, yeah, I could say if it was complete. So I'm going to deem it incomplete, and I'm going to just be deemed incomplete and stop at that point without the waivers granted, as it's okay. written here. Just. Everyone can, our seconder, did they, did they? Say it again, that's hard. Okay. So I'm just going to say, be it ordered, and then 15 running tide road be deemed incomplete with a period there and not reading the rest of it off. That's the motion on the uh, board to consider. Okay. All those in favor? Opposed? Abstaining? Motion carries four to two with one abstaining. If I may, Madam Chair, can I ask a question? Certainly. Because part of the information that Steve was looking for was for a full 22 foot wide roadway, and where we requested no to reduce that to 14 foot with two foot gravel shoulders. We need some guidance from this board whether or not it's reasonable to expect that that waiver would be considered. Okay. because it's predicated on the work that we're going to have to do. If we have to, the board is not going to consider the, the reduction or the waiver for that, then it's a whole different set of engineering plans that yep. have to be submitted. I understand. So what is the uh, feeling on the reduction of the width of the private access way? I'm fine. To I'm, eight fine. I'm fine with that. I'm fine. I'm fine. So do we okay. want to make it? A, no. No? Okay. No. I just asked for a poll. Okay. I know you can't. So you so you're on set there. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any, any, um, now it's time for comment on any items that are not on the agenda. Anybody have any comments? Hey, Bill. No one's jumping up. All right. Yeah, I couldn't find that. Do I have a motion from somebody? Motion to adjourn. Sure. Okay, second. And that one. Yeah, was something else. Here we go. All those in favor? Is the only one you printed? Yeah. Okay. Here. Thank you.